Graham Bodie, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to have this chat with you today. You are an expert in listening, which is such an interesting field. Um, you know, really, you're an expert in communication, and and I'll read your your bio in just a moment for all the listeners, so they can get a sense of of your expertise and all all the great work that you're doing. Um, but today we're going to be focusing on the dynamics of successful speaker listener exchanges and how that applies into the workplace. And what leaders can do to be better listeners, to help their team members be better listeners, ultimately so that everyone can can be more productive, be more you know successful in navigating our relationships, whether it be at home, in the workplace, whatever. Um, as we get started, I wanted to share uh, Graham's bio with the listeners. Graham Bodie is an internationally recognized communication scholar whose work focuses on what all organizations and individuals need to do better. Listen. Based on his extensive knowledge of how individuals and teams can more effectively communicate and build consensus, Dr. Brody facilitates customized workshops and delivers compelling keynote addresses for groups of all sizes. His work has been funded by the National Science Foundation and featured in the Wall Street Journal, Psychology Today, and National Radio, uh, Public Radio. Dr. Brody received his BA and MA from Auburn University and his PhD from Purdue University. He teaches court, uh, courses in integrated marketing communication at the University of uh, Mississippi and dedicates substantial time to mend our frayed social fabric through his work with the nonprofit Listen First Project. Uh, what an awesome background and set of expertise and education that you bring to the table for this discussion today. Um, as we really get started and dive into the discussion, anything else you would like to share by way of personal background, context, or anything you'd like the listeners to know? Yeah, it's uh, interesting. You know, thanks for the, the introduction. The, the notion of being an expert in anything, particularly something like listening, makes it sound like I always do the right thing, which is totally not true. Um, as what I tell my students um, it is that uh, I'm not going to give you a magic bullet or a magic wand that will allow you to always be the best listener in every situation, but I am going to give you the vocabulary that when you do mess up, you'll know how not only to fix that uh, issue within yourself, but how to talk about uh, how you messed up with those individuals um, that you messed up with and um, potentially try to mend the, you know, the, 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 to mend the frustration or whatever negative consequences resulted in that. You know, human behavior is, as much as engineers want it to be, it's not something that we necessarily can fully engineer. Um, even if we can get close to predicting, um, you know, certain types or aggregates um, of human behavior, communication behavior, you know, in, you know included in that, um, you'll never listen to your fullest potential with everybody all the time. Uh, and so um, not even an expert in listening can always do that uh, efficiently. Yeah, yeah. And, and certainly being an expert does not mean um, that we have it all figured out or that we are perfect in what we're doing, right? We're, we're all fumbling through, um, but you do have a tremendous background, you know, in terms of the research you do, in terms of the stuff you teach, the, the workshops you put on. Um, and and I think that that brings to the table a lot of uh, really great insights that uh, that we need, frankly, because like you, like your bio says, um, we are struggling right now as a society. We have a frayed social fabric. Um, and so a lot of your efforts in the, the Listen First project focus on this. How can we be better communicators? How can we be better listeners? Particularly in an environment where things are so polarized, where um, people are so defensive and um, it's just so difficult to have a constructive conversation with someone who has a different perspective than you. Um, maybe now more than it's been any time in the last several generations at least. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a struggle, and that's just talking generally about society, but also in the workplace, this, we have the same struggles uh, of being effective leaders through listening um, can be a real challenge because frankly, we're, we're all busy, we're all kind of running around, sometimes like chickens with their heads cut off, you know, just trying to put out fires and trying to make sure that we're making payroll and just doing all the things that need to happen so that business can stay open and, and we can provide the products and services for our people, uh, for our customers. But we need to focus on our people and we need to focus on, on having those good relationships and how to be effective 
in our leadership and our listening. And that's a challenge. It's just a real big challenge for, for any leader, regardless of how well-intentioned they may be or how much attention they want to try to put towards it. Yeah. And I mean, before a listener gets scared off, whoa, 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 I'm not, you know, afraid social fabric, polarization, politics. Like I don't want, you know, I see what happened to Goodyear. I see what happened to, you know, fill in the blank. Um, the, the fact is that, that the workplace is where we spend the majority of our time. If we are employed outside of the home, the, the workplace, whether that workplace is virtual now more than, more than it has been, or it is a physical office space that you go to and interact with other individuals, even if now it's physically distanced. Um, the fact that A, we spend most of our day in a workplace setting of some sort, and B, most of that um, time is spent communicating with other people, either through email or face-to-face -face or over a, a Zoom or Google Meet or some other kind of technology platform or Slack, right? Text-based, video-based, voice-based, communication consumes a, a huge amount of our day and of that time spent communicating and you can go back on the research on this from back in the 1920s and 1930s all the way till the present day study after study after study suggests that a large portion of that communication time up to two-thirds in some situations in some contexts is spent in listening uh, now whether you define that listening as reading a text message or reading an email or listening to a lecture or being in a webinar or listening to a client or listening to someone on the other end of the phone complain about your company and try to, you know, you know, calm them down and, you know, do something about customer relationships and customer service. Whatever your context is, communication in the workplace, right, uh, is, 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 is all consuming. And because we spend so much time in it and because we're all, you know, um, you know, uh, fragile humans that, 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 you know, don't do things perfectly, like not find the words, like just like I did right there, um, we make mistakes, right? And so there's some decent research that suggests that uh, communication problems account for upwards of 15, 20 hours per week in lost productivity. Um, the fact that we try to multitask is an additional loss of productivity to, to our, our, our bottom line. And it costs small to medium-sized businesses upwards of $500,000 a year just in miscommunication. So the cost of miscommunication can be uh, a pretty sizable amount, even for a smaller or medium-sized business. And so how much time do we spend thinking about communication problems, thinking about how we interact with each other, thinking about how we design our teams for more efficiency and better productivity. How much time do we spend actually debriefing, not just about um, the, the product or um, the issue, but about how we deal with each other, how we communicate and how we listen with each other. And if we're honest, we probably don't spend as much time um, at that then, you know, versus how important we think communication is. Because when you ask people, and I do this in my workshops, when I ask people how important is listening and communication to your job, everybody says it's very important. And then I say, well, how much time do you spend getting better at it? And everybody sort of says, well, not much, right? I might read a book here or there, or I might, you know, click on an article on, in, in Forbes, you know, on a Thursday afternoon, but I don't really spend a lot of uh, sustained effort and time, some serious study in really trying to hone my communication and my listening skills. And that's a problem. It's a disconnect between the importance we think uh, uh, that, that it has and the, and the and importance we place on it. And we hire for good communication and we look for those qualities in people. And, and yet we don't really spend the time that we need and the effort that we need really honing those skills based on solid research, uh, based on, you know, solid, solid scholarship. Yeah. Oh, I completely agree. And I mean, some of those statistics you shared are startling on, on the cost, the time, uh, the lost productivity, you know, all of that just because of listening and, and, or, or rather from miscommunication and, and, and poor listening. And, you know, I, I, I do a lot of work in people management, HR, uh, organizational development and change. And, you know, what I tell my students, what I tell my clients, what I, a lot of what happens in, in my own research is it comes back to effective communication. When you see breakdowns, when you see poor change management, when you see um, uh, poor uh, leader employee relationships, when you see uh, a breakdown in performance management processes and effective feedback. All of that comes back to 
communication and and a lot of it's not rocket science like we're there there are like there's no like silver bullet secret to like being an effective communicator but it, it comes back to being intentional it, it becomes back to being present in the moment being like wholly there with the person you're communicating with rather than like you said trying to multitask and being distracted or trying to formulate the next thing you want to say in response to what they're saying but just like being present and being there, so much of the challenges in organizations can be resolved just by more effective communication, more effective listening. And it's not rocket science, yet, to your point, so few leaders end up putting the resources and the time and the energy towards that really important facet of what it means to be a good leader, to be an effective communicator, to be a good listener. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what what the effective way is to kind of shake people out of the complacency when it comes to effective communication or lack thereof. Any thoughts on that? Like in your workshops, what do you talk about with, with leaders, you know, in trying to help convince them that, yeah, this is worth your time. You, you know, you should be spending, you know, X amount of time daily, weekly, just focusing on your skills, capabilities, and competencies as they relate to listening. Yeah, I mean, so in addition to doing, you know, some sort of revelatory, um, you know, activities where you, you know, can spark, um, you know, false memories in people, or you can make them, you know, think they heard something in a narrative that they that wasn't actually there. Really, the the sort of when it, you know, you, the, when you say it's not rocket science, well, maybe we should treat it a little bit more like rocket science than common sense, right? Maybe maybe we, if it's on a continuum from like complete common sense to like you know, really difficult, you know, physical equations or whatever. Maybe we should lean a little bit more toward that end of the continuum where we treat it as a complex phenomenon that we ought to be able to like, you know, unpack and study and, and, and learn. Um, and, and, and it has some structure, like some, some actual science behind it. Uh, even if it is sort of, you know, to some extent an art, like medicine. Medicine is a science and an art. You know, communication is, is sort of part art, part science. But if we took it a little bit more seriously, um, you know, one, one thing that, that's helped me in, in, in organizations is to suggest that like listening, um, like other human behaviors, is a habit. And you have learned over the course of your socialization um, to listen in particular ways. Um, it's not an immutable habit. It's not a temperament. Uh, it's not a personality trait, right? It's not a disc profile that you're, you're a DI and so, you know, you're a blue and, you know, you'll never not be a blue. So you need to learn how to work within your blueness or your greenness or whatever the you know um, categorization scheme is for your particular model of personality or temperament but it, it's habitual and so if we can learn how to listen uh how to be sort of a certain type of listener if we've learned habitually um how to listen in one way then we can unlearn that way we can learn sort of the strengths of the ways that we show up as a listener, as well as the challenges that are embedded in those ways of listening. And we can learn to listen in different ways. We can appreciate the fact that when eight people come to a single meeting, those eight people leave having thought they went to eight different meetings. And that's both beautiful and problematic. It's beautiful because you have eight different perspectives on what the meaning of that meeting was, on what the significance of that meeting was, of what you might do to solve problems that that meeting presented. But it's a problem because you have eight different people talking about eight different types of things from that meeting and you're not always, you're sort of ship sailing in the night, not really always talking about the same types of information. That one person gets passionate about this kind of information and another person gets passionate about this other kind of information. And if you took that sort of seriously as a strength in, in this notion that we call cognitive diversity now, um, the, the listening habits is, is kind of a marker for cognitive diversity. If you were to appreciate the fact that we all come to a situation as different kinds of listeners and we were to appreciate all the different kinds of information that we're all filtering in and out of our uh, of our brains that we are paying attention to some information and ignoring other information and we were able to sort of collect all that information together as a whole and really be able to discuss it right then then the power of that meeting is all these different perspectives coming out a single issue right in in different ways from different perspectives so um you know getting people out of this mode that there's one way to listen and we're all going to have to get to that way of listening that if we could only right and and you see the list you know perpetuated in all of the different channels you know 
shut up and eye contact and ask questions and paraphrase. And th these are important behaviors. Behaviors are important, but behaviors are simply behaviors. They don't deal with the mindset and they don't deal with the cognitive processes that are necessary to really fully comprehend and understand someone's not only their message, but their intention behind their message. So listening is a complex phenomenon that involves sensing, processing, and responding. It involves attitude and motivation. Usually when I go into an organization, there's that attitude and motivation already. People are already kind of excited about learning about listening. And so it's more about sort of doing activities that, uh, that, that sort of showcase how we can get things wrong cognitively. Uh, and then sort of, um, you know, somewhat question some of the assumptions that we make about what makes a good listener. Does a good listener always fill in the blank, right? Always make eye contact, always respond in a certain way or whatever, right? Um, and so sort of giving people a different vocabulary for talking about listening and giving them a set of tools to sort of assess their own capabilities, strengths and challenges, and then the ability to see how others are showing up as listeners so that I can speak into your primary listening style. So I can speak into how you prefer to process information so that you're more motivated, so that you get more, more out of my message. Uh, and so that as a leader, I can motivate you to do your best because I'm simply speaking into the way that you prefer to receive information. Yeah, well, that, that was amazing. I, I agree with everything you just said. And it's, it's an interesting perspective, you know, to, you know, I, I tend to frame things as it's not rocket science because I don't want people to get overwhelmed by the complexities of things right. and not try to tackle them. But you're absolutely right that something that may seem as simple as listening is actually, it's a complex phenomenon. Uh, and, and so it is worth paying attention to the research that's been done, that is ongoing. It's important for us to consider that just like many other skills, this is something that we have to practice. We have to work at it. We have to, we have to create the correct mindset. So, so I love the way you frame that. And I, and I do think that we need to be much more thoughtful about how we go about our communication and our listening, uh, really in all walks of life, but particularly, you know, as leaders, as we're working with our people, you know, we, we can't be effective leaders without effective communication and we can't effectively communicate without knowing our people and listening intently and communicating with them the way that they need to be communicated with, as you just mentioned, that's, that's really um, so, so important. Um, we are drawing close to the end of our time together today, but I wanted, I wanted to make sure that we took some time to discuss um, the Listen First project, because I know that's a passion of yours and you're doing some really great work there. Um, tell us a little bit more about what that is, what you're doing, and maybe a few of the things for listeners to look out for in relation to that project. Yeah, so the Listen First project is, is a movement that um, seeks to convince Americans that it's, um, you know, it's, it's high time to listen first to um, seek to understand um, others, uh, not just their positions, but understand that others, you know, everybody has sort of a shared humanity, that we're all humans, that we all des are deserving of respect. Um, and what we do as an organization is we um, help spearhead initiatives. Uh, the first uh, initiative that we help spearhead that, that kind of gains some ground is called National Conversation Project. We have about 325 organizations that power that project, we do a national week of conversation. Um, we would have been on our third year uh, this April, um, but our sort of plans for national week of conversation turned from a focus on what we called weaving community in a divided nation with a pretty close partnership with uh, David Brooks's Weave, the social fabric project, uh, stressing the need to connect and establish relationships in local communities with a focus on face-to-face -face conversations. And you can see why we didn't uh, quite get to be able to stress that as much as we wanted to because COVID hit. And we turned that, um, that National Week conversation into its own sort of organic um, campaign that we're calling Weaving Community During Crisis. And our primary sort of uh, message is that America is divided and broken, but we can begin to mend um, our um, differences um, you know, by establishing relationships, making connections, having conversations over uh, divides, um, that, that we can start doing that locally. Um, and so we encourage people to not only um, sort of um, 
behave in ways that uh, sort of generate kindness to their neighbors, whether it's baking cookies or doing chalk your walk or, um, you know, inviting, you know, your neighbor to sit on the driveway and, and you know, socialize with you on a Friday, socially distance appropriately, uh, but also to convene people um, on, um, you know, Zoom-like platforms to have conversations about issues that are important to them uh, that, that, are, that are sort of, um, grounded in relationships first, grounded in the fact that we can find some commonality, even if it's in a simple story of our name or a story of an experience that we share, um, either out of COVID or out of some other kind of shared experience. Um, and so really it's largely a social media kind of uh, movement where we're just um, lifting up these um, opportunities uh, that we find out there in sort of, and we connect them uh, into a larger whole that we call weaving community. Um, and so uh, any organization that's doing any kind of outreach that involves connection and relationships and conversations across the divide, we would consider a partner in that, um, in that initiative and we would invite them to be part of the weaving community campaign. And, uh, and basically we try to be that sort of that tide that lifts all boats, that all of the organizations that are doing all this fabulous work across the country and really across the globe, if we all sort of you know, set sail together and, and try to lift that, um, that common spirit of um, togetherness and relationships and listening first to understand that we can sort of, we can change the culture, um, which tends to be very divisive and vitriolic and you know, cancel culture, whatever you wanna call it. Um, it's if you don't agree with me, then I don't just disagree with you. I dislike you, distrust you, and I'm going to demoralize and demean you. I'm going to cancel you, and you're, I'm done with you. And we want to be able to, aside for some, from, from some very sort of important, you know, um, dehumanization activities, we want to recognize that, you know, John, you and I don't have to agree on everything, and that's okay, but we can agree that there is the possibility for common ground, there is a possibility of working together, there is a possibility of creating a community that we all want to see, a future that we all can believe in, an America that we can all thrive and strive uh, toward excellence in. Um, and of course, you know, moving into the 2020 election is making it a lot harder for this message to break through. You know, either the Democrats calling the Republicans evil or the Republicans calling the Democrats evil. Everybody's calling everybody evil. And if everyone's evil, then who's good, right? And we want to say like, there's goodness out there there are opportunities out there to really sort of just leave that nonsense behind and, and you know, um, whatever you think about the other candidate, can we all agree that there is an America that we want to build together, um, that we do have our problems, but the ideals of America can maybe bind us together. Um, well, and, and if they can't, then we can come up with some new ideals that can bind us together. Uh, and what are those? And let's work collectively to find those. Um, and so, you know, it's a little bit more than kumbaya, but there is a notion of sort of gathering together in communities, particularly in local communities at a grassroots level to sort of the, the, the theory of change is, is that kind of grassroots up. But we need companies and organizations and politicians and everybody else from the top down to also take on that spirit and change their rhetoric, change the way they operate on Facebook, change the way they tweet, change the way they interact with other people in the workplace and in their families and in their communities and beyond. So all of the above fits within what we're trying to do and we're trying to shift culture. We're trying to shift it toward the positive as opposed to the negative. Wonderful. And you know, what, what an, an important work. Um, I, so I really appreciate all the effort that you are putting in and, and everything that uh, um, people in your organization, all the effort that they're putting into this because it's so, so needed. Um, <clears throat> as we, close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners any, um, any last thoughts uh, about the topic, uh, anything uh, in terms of how they can get connected with you or find out more about what you're doing. Absolutely. So yeah, that, that, the, the latter of the questions is the easiest. It's listenfirstproject.org uh, is the uh, organizational website. You can find my research at grahambody.com. Um, and, and to get plugged in, we have a, a very simple request, some low-hanging fruit. It's called a pledge to listen first, and it simply reads, I will listen first to understand. If you can agree with those few words, then you can sign that pledge and, and sort of be, um, uh, you know, put into our database where we share out at least once a week an inspirational message called Listen First Friday, where we try to give you some simple thing to do that's a little bit different in your day-to-day -day, um 
sort of interactions with other people to, to humanize other people. Um, and, and um, you know, we, so we encourage people to follow us on Facebook and Twitter and to spread um, whatever messages that we're sending out there that they kind of, you know, agree with. Um, to the business community in particular, um, you know, this social movement and, and social change and culture change will not happen without the business community getting behind it. There's no successful social movement in American history that has uh, happened without some support of the business community. Um, so it is going to take some businesses um, sort of saying that they're fed up with the way the culture is right now, and that at least within their organization, that their organization is going to strive within their culture to be different, to train their employees differently, and to encourage their employees to, to be different kinds of, of people. And so we believe there's space for organizations to come on board, to be champions of the Listen First movement, um, and not only to benefit the, that organization and its workforce, but to allow that workforce to kind of go out and spread that message into the larger population. Um, and so we would encourage organizations to jump on board and leaders to, to sign up to be Listen First leaders and help us get that message out there. Excellent, excellent. Well, Graham, it has been a real pleasure talking with you and the time has flown by. Perhaps we can do this again sometime soon so we can continue to um, explore some of these topics in more depth. Um, it, but it's been a pleasure and I really encourage listeners to check out the website, reach out to Graham, get connected, figure out what, um, what he can do for you. Uh, and hopefully all of us can continue to think about how we can be more effective leaders through developing these communication skills and becoming more effective, um, more compassionate, more empathetic, uh, listeners as we interact with those people that we work with or at home or in our communities. Um, thanks everyone. I hope you all continue to stay healthy and safe, that everyone can continue to find meaning and purpose at work each and every day, that everyone has a great day. Thank you.